Hell's Kitchen, 1999. A time popularly considered the end of the millennium. Dear Matthew, I'm not a woman of faith. It's something you always teased me about. When you go to hell, Karen Page, you joke when I'd snore through your request to join you at Sunday Mass. I won't be able to rescue you. Don't think I have any pull down there just because of the outfit. But while my faith has never been as strong as yours, my love, I actually prayed last night over what to do about us. And I think I got an answer. When WFSK told me their sister station in Los Angeles offered me the AM drive time slot, we laughed at the idea of the show becoming Angel of the Morning. But what your heightened senses probably didn't pick up was that you were laughing a bit harder than I was. I've decided to take the job, Matt. Things between us lately haven't been the same since the Burroughs case. Yes, we've had moments of true intimacy, and your tenacious defense that cleared me of murder charges illustrated how, in both of your guises, you've always been my hero. And what a brave face you kept as they dragged my name through the mud. You never once expressed shame or judgment, verbally. Not a day goes by when I don't marvel over how someone I so completely wronged could let me back into their life so blithely. But that's just it, Matt. There will always be that feeling that you let me back into your life. It will always have been your choice. And as such, that disparity will always gnaw at me. And while you never talk about it, it's the occasional silence between us that says it all. I'm sure this sounds selfish. Like I want an unconditional love from someone who's seen me at my ultimate worst. Like I want 10 more percent from someone who's already given 120. I love you, Matthew Murdoch, in more ways than I can express. You will forever be at the center of all things for me. But this move will give us both time to figure out if we are truly in love, or just in love with the idea that we're strong enough to triumph over every adversity life throws our way or the ones my past has created for us. Be well, my hero. I shall think of you often, and if I ever become a woman of faith, I will pray for you and us. Love, Karen. In New York City, a child is born every eight minutes. The average maternity ward is staffed by eight to 12 nurses who spend all but their lunch breaks in a constant state of caretaking for patients they have no genetic ties to. At least twice a day, they ruminate aloud or to themselves about the need for a lighter workload. At 11.49 tonight, oh my God. they get their wish. Gwyneth used to sit out of gym class whenever she could. Her phys ed marks always brought down her grade point average, but Gwyneth rationalized the trade-off as a fair one. She figured that the obligatory laps that the phys ed instructor drilled the class with would never come in handy beyond high school. <laughs> this morning, Gwyneth's wishing she'd been a tad more grade conscious. In the quiet moments before the inevitable detection by the men in the car, Gwyneth recalled the day she told her very conservative Catholic parents that she was four months pregnant, and the quiet rage and shame she heard in their voices when they addressed her from that moment on. She cried herself to sleep, praying over and over, let this be the worst it gets. When she awoke in time to see the men beheading her mother over her father's corpse, Gwyneth was too terrified to mark the irony. <laughs> May the Lord fill you with his holy trust, offering absolution for the trespasses you're about to confess. Turn not a blind eye to his infinite mercy, but instead see with a pure heart the grace his sacrament of penance bestows on you. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's been far too long since my last confession. Six months ago, my girlfriend left me. Ah, 
the broken-hearted. Why is it you remember the Lord only after your significant others have forgotten you? Actually, Father, that's why I'm here. You see, I'm having a hard time remembering the Lord. Son, what you're going through is fairly common. When one feels their life is damaged in some way, their first instinct is to reach out to God. And because you're perhaps not as ardent in your relationship with the Lord when you're in a more corporal relationship, you feel the pangs of what we call Catholic guilt, a guilt that often manifests itself in a crisis of faith. That's what I'm here for. No, not now. Three blocks away, a girl, no more than 16, judging from that heartbeat. And a baby, maybe two months old or so. But what really has my attention is that Lincoln rushing her, doing about 90. What the faithful of the late 20th century tend to forget is that the Lord heals all who see him, more so than the latest self-help tome or the spiritualist of the month possibly can. All it requires is a leap of faith. All it requires is a leap of faith. When I was a child, I lost my sight, thanks largely to a good deed. Later in life, I continued the trend by becoming, one, a lawyer by day, and two, a costumed crime fighter by night. From nine to five, my name's Matt Murdock. After that, I go by Daredevil. The same accident that took my sight more than compensated for it with what you might call preternatural enhancement of every other sense, to the point where spatial perception isn't a hindrance. It's one of my greatest assets. For instance, I can hear on the street below the girl with the baby in her arms being chased down by a large sedan. The arrogance of John Q. Average Thug never ceases to amaze me. Don't these people read the papers or watch the news or even trade stories in a seedy bar somewhere? How is it they're never apprised of the fact that the kitchen is under my protection? The costume is lined with a meticulously woven micro-mesh steel fiber. God bless Reed Richards. The hydrant the car crash burst open falls under the billion-a-year insurance policy the city took out for these kind of damages. I brokered the deal last month. Pro bono. More of that Catholic guilt the Padre was talking about. The adrenaline rush subsides once the threat is neutralized. And I'm back to square one, battling that aching sense of morose solitude I woke up with. I thought a visit to church might alleviate it, like when I was a kid and I'd obsess over... No, stay focused on the task at hand. First, clean up the mess. One out cold, one subdued enough to leave in the hands of New York's finest. That gives me a moment to concentrate on the object of their pursuit and find out why. She's gone. <sighs> Getting the truth out of the two jokers in the car is going to prove fruitless without her testimony. Which means I'll spend the next few minutes explaining to the police why I felt the need to put my fist through the windshield of a car and destroy city property. <sighs> Thanks, little girl. You've just made my life incrementally more difficult. The offices of Sharp, Nelson, and Murdoch. Hmm. Attorney Matt Murdoch broods at his desk. The isotope which robbed me of one sense heightened the other four to the extent that even months after she's gone, I still smell her in the sheets I've washed a hundred times over. My apartment, while well appointed, isn't what I'd call lush or huge by any means. It is, after all, a Hell's Kitchen apartment. But given that, there are still rooms I haven't been in for months. <sighs> The bathroom off the master bedroom is one. We designated that as her bathroom. This morning, a guy who spends half his life as a man without fear tried to summon the courage to use a brush in that bathroom. The bristles were still tangled with her hair. <sighs> this is ridiculous. I need something to take my mind off her. Or someone. Natasha. Her number's the third column on the phone, last button on the right. How honest a boyfriend was I, after all. I kept an old flame's number on my speed dial. I tell myself it's her shield satellite link-up code, the one she gave me in case of terrorist threats beyond my capabilities. 
I'm a good liar. Comes with the job. What's the big deal? I want to talk to her about a case, or Hydro Rumor, or... All right. So I'm not such a good liar. Hey, Matt, you got a minute? Absolutely, Mr. Nelson. Am I fired or something? <laughs> such a kidder. Uh, Matt... I want you to meet Lydia McKenzie. I've been helping her with a case. Call it what it is, Foggy. A multi-million dollar divorce. A pleasure to meet you, Mr. Murdoch. Foggy does nothing but rave about you. Her pulse barely picks up as we shake hands. Apparently I'm not her type. But I'm getting that Foggy is. No wonder he's behind on his caseload. Uh, if you want to guarantee yourself a decent settlement, Miss McKenzie, I'd advise you to switch counsel. He also warned me that you're quite the smoothie. I've read a number of your cases in the papers. You get more press than Johnny Cochran, if that's possible. There. Those dual heart signatures again. The girl and the baby from before. Can't lose them. There's still a chance to book those thugs if I can secure her testimony. Mr. Murdoch, it's Mr. Parker from the Bugle on 3. He has those photos you requested of you and Miss Page from the Goodwill Hunting premiere. Would you like them sent over? Damn. Lost them again. Mr. Murdoch? Uh, yes. Thank you, Kim. God knows why I'm spending the night looking for that girl. In truth, Murdoch, in your heart of hearts, you're saying to yourself, you're looking for the wrong girl. I swear, Karen, I tried never to judge you or your past. I had nothing but the best intentions for you. But we know what road they pave. And so here I am, soaring through the night sky, busying myself with another fool crusade, all in an effort not to go home to an empty house filled with memories. Filled with you. No! No, please! Stop it! That's not what you really want. I pick up the stench of violent need. The erratic pulse of someone who's disregarding all that was instilled in him as a child. I unholster the billy club, uncouple it to release the grappling line. It also makes for a nice retrievable projectile weapon. I know what you really want. Lord, every night you put on an immorality play for me. You show me the disparity of man's magnificence to his actions. You came to light the way. And we still seek the darkest corners to sate our lowest impulses. Oh, I'm gonna kill you, you son of a- oh. How disappointing it must be for you to see us at our worst. Thank you. Thank you. If you even exist. The Meatpacking District, around 3 a.m. In the deserted alleyway, Gwyneth has curled herself into a corner of a building. Her infant sleeps peacefully, swaddled and snug in the folds of Gwyneth's ragged jean jacket. Physically drained, Gwyneth herself has just started to nod off when she is visited. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Lord. The law offices of Sharp, Nelson, and Murdoch. Foggy, you know how I feel about divorce cases. I know, I know. The only reason I took it on was because Rosalind was badgering me about financial quotas, Matt. But this one is different. Her husband, he did something to her. Let me guess, he left her for a girl young enough to be their daughter? He had her sterilized, Matt. What? She didn't even know until her last gynecological exam. He had it done without her knowledge. Hearing something like that makes me wonder where I stand on God. I sometimes feel like he's standing on me. Lydia's is... <sighs> special, eh? She deserves better. This coming from the guy who's practically Mr. Liz Osborne? Yes, Liz. I like Liz. I love Liz, but... She's no Lydia. No, Foggy. Do not tell me you've got a case of Florence Nightingale sin- Matt? What's the matter? They're near. I can hear them. Hear who? Is this tights type stuff? They're close. So close I can catch a whiff of that unmistakable- You're not gonna change your clothes here, are you? New baby smell. Hello, Mr. Murdoch. 
I'm sorry. The young lady bolted by me before I had a chance it's to... It's all right, Kim. She and I are old friends. Would you be so kind as to secure a can of formula and a yoo-hoo for our guests? Um, sure, but you've got an appointment. Cancel it. Thanks. I'm gonna have to get back to you on the Mackenzie case, Fogg. I hope there's nothing you're not telling me here. She's a little young for you, isn't she, Maddie? Out, you. So you might imagine my father's reaction, Mr. Murdoch, let alone everyone else. I mean, coming from a 15-year-old, I guess it was kind of hard for everyone to swallow. About the father? About my virginity. I see. Go on. Needless to say, I'm flabbergasted. A condition that's only exacerbated as she proceeds to explain how she's never been with anyone. And how, until that morning, she had no explanation as to how she came to be with, then have, a child. She follows this with a tale about the murder of her parents at the hands of the men who were chasing her, all over this seemingly immaculate conception. I'd write it off as the overactive imagination of a kid who's watched far too many episodes of The X-Files. Except her pulse hasn't altered a beat in all the time she's been talking. And she's emitted not a single pheromone. She's telling the truth. Or at least she's convinced herself she is. So, what would you like me to do, Gwyneth? With your testimony, we can prosecute the thugs that were chasing you. I'm confident we can get you into the witness protection program. But, I thought you knew. Knew what? The dream. The angel. She said you'd protect my baby. Well... I can offer you both legal protection, if that's what the angel meant. Mr. Murdoch, the angel told me you're daredevil. <sighs> Do you study your Bible, Mr. Murdoch? Not since 10th grade CCD classes at St. Benedict's. Though right about now, I wish I'd stayed current. The Redeemer swore he'd return in the final days to save the just and judge the wicked. I don't know why they chose me, but this child is that Redeemer. In 30 years' time, its work will begin. She hands me the infant. Stunned, I take it without thinking. You have to shield the child from the evil men who are chasing me, chasing us. Please keep my baby safe, at least until help arrives. You're a good man. The angel told me, I trust you. You're our only hope, Mr. Murdoch. You're this world's only hope. Her kiss on my cheek is almost ethereal. Keep the faith. Hey, hey! Wait a second! At 5.25 p.m., the Mother of the World vanishes from the law offices of Sharp, Nelson, and Murdoch. At 5.26 p.m., the Savior is left in the Devil's care.